Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Simon Heller from Sheffield. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in the meeting, and I'm only sorry that I can't be there in person. The title of my talk is Comparing Interventions to Treat Hypoglycemia Unawareness, What Wins? These are my disclosures, and this is the outline. I want to talk a little bit about what impaired awareness is and why it's important, how we measure it, uh, and then uh, I will consider the different interventions which address impaired awareness and come to some conclusions. It seems appropriate 100 years after insulin was first used uh, to treat diabetes to consider uh, who was the first person to identify hypoglycemia as a side effect of treatment? And it was indeed Frederick Banting who, uh, in the BMJ paper, uh, described the hypoglycemic reactions. And he also realized, along with his colleagues, that they constitute uh, a real source of danger. And another individual whose life was saved by insulin, R.D. Lawrence, who went on to work at King's College Hospital in London, uh, that in 1941, he was the first one uh, to describe impaired awareness. Uh, he identified this on himself uh, and uh, concluded that only after five to 10 years, he found it the rule that insulin reactions change the autonomic symptoms, uh, which are missed out. Uh, and then uh, the patient proceeds to more serious CNS manifestations. And he's absolutely right. And so he realized many, many years ago how important uh, the, that impaired awareness was uh, in terms of hypoglycemic risk. And you might consider that with all the developments in diabetes treatment that we've seen, particularly over the last 20 years, that hypoglycemia uh, is no longer becoming a problem. But these data, which were presented at the ESD uh, uh, scientific meeting in 2020, shows that hypoglycemia remains a huge uh, problem. Uh, if we look at the incidence in terms of events per patients per year, and we're talking severe hypoglycemia design, defined as needing the help of another person to recover, you can see that uh, hypoglycemia is very common, not only in type 1 diabetes, as, as shown in dark, but um, in the gray, you can see that in the US, with a very modern healthcare system, uh, the incidence is two episodes per person year. Uh, and that is very recent data. And if you look at the proportion of those who've experienced one event, looking at a population-based study, 33% of all patients on insulin with type 2 diabetes are experiencing severe hypoglycemia. Excuse me, the slides are not visible. And impaired awareness of hypoglycemia increases risk. As you can see on this slide, um, the prevalence of impaired awareness uh, overall in type mm -hmm. 1 diabetes is around 20%. Compared to people with normal awareness, those with impaired awareness are significantly older have had diabetes for longer, but 14 years versus 23 oh, years sure. is, is, not, um, is not as much as we might expect. But perhaps most important of all, if you have impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, you can see that the frequency is much higher um, in those who are affected, a six times higher frequency of severe hypoglycemia. And if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that with increasing duration, the percentage of patients affected uh, are indeed much greater. Now, we can define impaired awareness in various ways, but the most common clinical way is to use different questionnaires. And I have show you three here, the Clark method, which is developed in the US, the Gold method, which is developed in, in Scotland, the University of Edinburgh, uh, and in various ways. But the most common clinical way is to use different questionnaires. And I have show you three here, the Clark method, which is developed in the US, the Gold method, which is developed in, in Scotland, the University of Edinburgh, uh, and a more recent uh, questionnaire, the HypoAQ, which we've used uh, 
is obviously longer, but arguably is a bit more accurate. And all of these uh, are a way of defining uh, severe hypoglycemia with the higher score, uh, as you can see, uh, showing impaired awareness for Clark uh, and Gold. There's a reasonable correlation between these measures of awareness, which you uh, can ascertain clinically, and autonomic symptoms during uh, hypoglycemia. So questioning patients during uh, a hypoglycemic clamp, for example, shows a reasonable correlation. But importantly, uh, it's a lot less likely to do so when you measure counter-regulatory hormones, particularly catecholamines, uh, epinephrine or uh, adrenaline uh, and glucose production. So the relationship between impaired awareness as measured by scales uh, and defects in counter-regulation are not uh, as close as one would like. Nevertheless, they serve the purpose. Now we know that one episode of hypoglycemia from work that we did way back in the early 1990s uh, will uh, cause a defect in both symptoms and counter-regulatory hormones. In this study, which has been uh, was done in normal subjects, medical students, but it's been repeated in both people with type 2 and type 1 diabetes, what we did was to um, measure the catecholamine and symptom score on day one. In the afternoon, we lowered the glucose to around 50 milligrams per deciliter for two hours. And the morning after we invited the subjects back and you can see that just 24 hours later, they had a marked impairment in their catecholamine response at around 2.5, 45 milligrams per deciliter and their symptom score was reduced. So we had induced impaired awareness of hypoglycemia with one two hour episode of hypoglycemia. Now, this having been demonstrated, uh, other uh, groups, this is a study from Stephanie Amiels, showed that if we could avoid all hypoglycemia for a few weeks, then we could restore, at least in part, uh, some of these um, uh, defects and improve awareness. So here you can see a group of 12 individuals, type one patients with impaired awareness, three weeks absence of hypoglycemia, a symptom threshold for symptoms around uh, 40 milligrams per deciliter, cognitive in function becoming impaired around 50, uh, and having avoided all hypoglycemia, you can see uh, that the symptom threshold had risen to just around 55. Cognitive function was unchanged. So it shows how you can restore awareness by avoiding hypoglycemia. So if we conclude about uh, impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, it affects around a quarter of adults with type 1, up to 10% of insulin-treated uh, type 2 patients. It's inducible by exposure to hypoglycemia and long duration. It can be reversed by avoiding uh, a glucose less than 54, and importantly, it increases the risk of severe hypoglycemia in type 2 diabetes 17-fold in one study. So how do we address the issues? Let's think about what treatments might be useful. Well, the first is, how, what about new insulins? And this is a nice crossover study. It went on for two years. It was a one, uh, one year, the hypoana study, in which they treated patients either with human insulin or analog insulin. And they showed uh, in this randomized crossover study uh, with a long duration of treatment that when patients were treated with analog insulin, then there was a 30% risk, risk reduction in severe hypoglycemia absolute risk reduction of 0.5 severe episode patient per year. And you can see very clearly that the benefit is reducing nocturnal hypoglycemia. And so that was, that was the benefit. So now let's look uh, at other treatments. Uh, all the benefit at night. What about new technology? Well, I'm going to show you just three studies uh, which have looked at 
treating people with impaired awareness at risk of severe hypoglycemia. Here's one uh, in which you can see that uh, the patients are crossed over to either blood glucose monitoring or CGM. Uh, it's a randomized crossover study. If we look at the biochemical hypoglycemia, in those patients, uh, when they're on CGN, they have less uh, low glucose values below um, 3.555 milligrams per deciliter. They have less severe hypoglycemia below, uh, uh, below 50 milligrams per deciliter. So undoubted benefit in duration of low glucose. They reduce severe hypoglycemic episodes dramatically, needing third-party assistance, less effect, and coma or seizure. But importantly, there was no change in impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. Here's another study, the SMILE trial, in where they looked at hybrid closed loop, the most modern technology in type 1 diabetes, six months, 153 uh, participants uh, using suspend before low glucose. And you can see, again, quite a, a big reduction in their primary endpoint, which was the number of hypoglycemic events below 55 milligrams per deciliter. So undoubtedly, suspend insulin pumps work, but there was no significant change in impaired awareness. So what we see is a pattern that reducing hypoglycemia uh, is of course of considerable benefit, but it's not affecting impaired awareness. Here's another study that we were involved in. This was a two by two factorial study in 100 adults with impaired awareness. Uh, and here you can see the percentage time uh, spent below 3.0 millimoles uh, per liter, 55 milligrams per deciliter during the trial. So quite a marked reduction uh, in period spent low, a marked reduction in severe episodes as shown on the right, uh, and the treatments were education alone, pumps, CGM, or pumps and CDM. Uh, brief education at the start, then they went on to the technology and those who were randomized to do so, but actually there was, a, and an improvement in awareness. So here's a study which shows no difference between technology, uh, education, and yet an improvement in awareness. So it kind of stands out as an unusual study. Finally, let's talk about education. This is uh, uh, evidence from Germany where they use uh, instrument training and treatment uh, program of education. In the year before, they were having a lot of hypoglycemia, particularly those with a lower A1C, and yet after the training program, inpatient for seven days, you can see that relationship has gone. In other words, the lower the A1C, um, the, uh, uh, didn't make any difference, the risk of severe hypoglycemia. We've used a, a similar program called Daphne in the UK. And you can see after the education program, the year after, uh, a marked improvement in awareness of hypoglycemia. Um, and more patients uh, who were aware. And so awareness is improving in education, which we don't seem to see in technology, which I think is of interest. Um, this meta-analysis looked at educational technology and pharmacological interventions, and they show that educational interventions overall did indeed improve uh, both severe hypoglycemia and some improved awareness. Technology improved glycemic control, uh, particularly in combination with structured education, but most did not improve awareness. And pharmacology studies showed no difference, although as you can see, the number of studies were far less, uh, and patients, importantly, with hypoglycemia were often excluded. Since this publication, there's been one over crossover trial, impaired awareness, uh, recently published. It failed to restore counter-regulatory hormones uh, and impaired awareness as measured by scales, uh, although hypoglycemia was reduced. So nothing has changed.
So what explains these inconsistent results? I think it's naive to expect a single therapeutic intervention to correct a maladaptive stress response. Impaired awareness is heterogeneous. It consists of defective counterregulation, not only due to repeated hypoglycemia, but a long duration of diabetes. And so I think we need to do our research much better. We need a range of measurements, clinical, biochemical, uh, and others to define the phenotype more accurately if we're going to learn from clinical trials. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, after 100 years of insulin, hyperglycemia remains a major barrier preventing people with insulin-treated diabetes, including type 2, from achieving targets. Large trials are required, enabling us to define the phenotype and measure counter-regulatory hormone responses to improve clinical approaches. And in the meantime, technology clearly offers great promise, at least in countries where it can be afforded, particularly in those who've participated in structured education. And I should emphasize that structured education is cheap uh, and can be delivered uh, globally. And finally, what's the only thing that will restore counter-regulatory hormones? Well, this study from uh, Mike Rickles and colleagues shows islet transplantation is very successful, not only in restoring uh, epinephrine responses, but uh, glucagon as well. So until we can use cellular therapy to treat both type 1 and possibly type 2, patients will continue to have a problem. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention.